Fellow Singaporeans, thank you for being here today. Lately, a lot has been said about our education system. Every single critic of our education system has found fault with it, from streaming to tuition to teacher-student ratio and our system of meritocracy. It is interesting that while these critics say that a lot of things are wrong with our education system, international data seem to suggest that our education system is doing well. The McKinsey Report last year in 2010, entitled How the World's Most Improved School Systems Keep Getting Better, ranked Singapore as one of the top educational systems among 20 from around the world. Our educational reforms started in 1979, which is the earliest among the 20 systems surveyed. And we have been consistently improving, hence labeled as a top sustained improver. Our current performance level is ranked as great together with Hong Kong, South Korea, Saxony in Germany, and Ontario, Canada, where each system achieved more with similar or fewer resources. Another example, the Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study, or TIMS, is conducted by the International Association for Evaluation of Educational Achievement, or IEA. In 2007, Singapore ranked first in science for primary four and secondary two. For mathematics, Singapore ranked second at primary four, just behind Hong Kong, and third at secondary two, behind Chinese Taipei and Republic of Korea. On average, Singapore was about 88 points above the international scale average and about 63 points above the U.S. for each grade level and subject. It is interesting to note that students across all streams express normal academic, normal technical, were involved in the TIM study. This alludes to the fact that overall, our students across the academic streams are better than most other students from different parts of the world. If our streaming system is a failure, this achievement would not have been possible. It is important to realize that streaming was a precursor to our current ability-driven education system that has provided many different pathways to cater to different abilities as well as interests. For instance, students who take foundation, foundation level mathematics can also take standard level English in primary schools. Students can also pursue their interests and, or nurture their abilities in areas other than the academic, such as in the school for the arts, the sports school, and even in music elective programs. As for private tuition, it is not a Singapore phenomenon, nor does it mean that there is something wrong with our education system. It is happening across Asia and most parts of the world. As Mark Bray mentioned in his paper on private tutoring that was published in 2006, I quote, private tutoring has a long history in both Western and Eastern societies. In recent decades, it has greatly increased in scale and has become a major phenomenon in practically all regions of the world. My own students, who are heads of departments in different primary and secondary schools, recently came back from a week-long study trip to various countries. One of the countries that they visited was Vietnam. Even in the rural schools, Tuition is a norm rather than an exception. The parents who are farmers who earn about eight US dollars a day or about 240 US dollars a month 
spend one hundred U.S. dollars a month on their children's tuition. That's about forty percent of their income. So it's not just happening here in Singapore. It has been recommended that the teacher-student ratio be one is to twenty, down from the current one is to forty. As it is, our primary one and two pupils classes have about thirty students. As it is, subject-based banding in primary schools and even in some secondary schools allows smaller classes of students to be taught by every teacher. Drastically slashing the ratio to one is to twenty will have far greater implications than we would realize. Halving the ratio drastically. Is likely to mean increasing the number of teachers, increasing the number of classrooms, and increasing the education budget. But maybe we need to dig into our reserves for some small change. Our system of meritocracy has helped us ensure that both equal and equitable opportunities are available. Those who are able to run forward can do so. While those who need some help will be given thus, let us not begrudge those who have succeeded and who have done so through their own sweat, blood, and tears, and on their own merit. Let us not belittle the effort that they have put in, and expect constant perfection out of them while demonstrating mediocrity. It is very easy to criticize what we already have. And offer spurious alternatives. However, it must be realized that changes cannot be implemented because of mere sentiments, or emotive arguments, or a singular perspective. Rather, changes need rational thought, should be driven by data and facts, and would require the ability to see and understand the big picture. I believe that this can be achieved if we work together for the future of our nation, rather than trying to discredit one another and stir emotions. Let us consider objectively and make our choice rationally, rather than emotionally. I believe that together we can secure a better future. Thank you. Thank you. 